Okay, folks, welcome. I am recording this video. I hope to get it in one shot. We shall see. Um, this is my take on a few pieces from Jacob chapter 2 through 4. Uh, that's what we're studying this week. Uh, chapters 2 through 4. I'm going to touch on a couple of things that pointed out to me that were very special. Uh, and when I do that, uh, my hope is that in the comments, I will publish this in YouTube, but I will also post it in Facebook in different areas. And I want people to um, pause this video on some of the questions that I ask, read some of the scriptures uh, that, I might, that I'm going to reference and cross-reference, and give me your take. I think the idea uh, when it comes to gospel instruction is not just lecture alone, but we all share together that we might all be edified. Um, I'm really excited because there's verses here that um, really jumped out to me. So I'll try to go quickly and simply. Um, if you're newer to the gospel uh, or, or, or to studying and, and, and whatnot, um, I want you to show you a little bit about my scriptures. You can see that they're scribbled in, colored in. Uh, anything that I cross-reference is also there. Um, I do the same on my electronic device. I'm actually getting more and more and more just doing it here, uh, but I like to keep both, and um, it's a very special treat. I know that one of the most important ways in which you grow in faith in Jesus Christ is um, by thinking about the scriptures often and letting all the different ones come together to create that whole uh, vista, the whole picture of, of truth uh, that comes together, and that's what we're going to work on tonight. Hopefully change our hearts so we can be more like Christ. That's the goal. So, uh, with that said, uh, that's the intro here. We really want to get to our hearts as best we can um, as we look at this. So, or excuse me, it's not Jacob chapter 2 through 4, it's Jacob 1 through 4. Okay. So the first verse that I want us to look at together is Jacob um, chapter 1, verse 8. Please note this. Go there, chapter 1, verse 8. And a little bit of background so that we're kind of aware of what's happening here. Um, we are still hundreds and hundreds of years before Christ is going to be born uh, on the earth um, in Jerusalem. These are people in the Americas, 500-ish um, years before Christ is born, and they are um, practicing the law of Moses, and um, they have been shown um, how the law of Moses uh, points to Jesus Christ. And um, I love this because um, a great um, instructor, educator, uh, once said, when we look back at these things, we have to realize that these people were smart. We think that we're in an age of intelligence and study and knowledge and whatnot today. When we look back in time, you come to realize people knew a lot about life and what it, what it brings to the table for all of us and teach us a lot of things on how to be better at life. And so that's the goal as we look at this first scripture. So, um, I want to outline couple different areas so let's just read it here so Jacob chapter 1 verse 8 wherefore we would to God that we could persuade all men not to rebel against God to provoke him to anger but that all men would believe in Christ and view his death and suffer his cross and bear the shame of the world wherefore I Jacob take it upon me to fulfill the commandment of my brother Nephi I love how Jacob takes these things and breaks them out now Jacob, first off, talks about persuading, and if we have some time, oops, if we have some time, we will talk more about persuading in righteous ways, right? Gentleness, love unfeigned, and there's a little bit about rebellion that he talks about here, and also he talks about anger. What does it mean that God is angry, right? Because most of the world wants to tell you that God is love, which is true, or that all there is, or all we need to survive is love, which is true. But when you look at God from strictly from an angle of he's just love and there's no other emotions about his existence, it doesn't quite fit. There's an element of God's anger here that we can explore quite extensively um, in good ways, not crazy ways, good ways, so that we understand ourselves better 
and we can become better people, better intelligences, you know. So a whole bunch of stuff right in here, but I'm not going to talk about that today, but you can. Maybe in your comments, some stuff about persuasion, about rebellion and anger, please um, go in there and let's talk about that. But the areas I want to talk about in this particular scripture is that all men um, believe in Christ. Now, that's another big one. Um, so I'm going to put believe up here too. I before E, I always get that wrong. Believe in Christ. Uh, we could continue many, many conversations of all areas of faith that talked about that. And yes, that's the biggest part of it. I'm not going to focus on that one either, but if you want to put in comments, I would love that. Um, so the ones that we're going to put together, Jacob says, view his death. So we're going to look at that one. View his death. Suffer his cross and bear the shame of the world. And again, think about this. If it's actually true, this man Jacob, 500 years before Christ is born, knows about his death, knows about his cross, he knows about the shame of what it means to be a true believer in Jesus Christ. Um, and I really love this. Jacob's is trying to teach us how to become, right? That's all we ever really want to do. We want to exercise our faith in Christ and let his grace come over us and be baptized of water and of fire and to be changed, that our hearts are changed, that we truly become like Christ, that in essence, that which we say will in turn become that which we do. Um, we all are never aligned in that, but we want to keep trying. And um, so what does it mean to view his death? So I hope that you are doing this if you're not. So for newbies or young people, view his death is one line. You can now take and link, cross-reference all the scriptures that can have to do with this, that we can piece together to make this more meaningful um, and you can also cross-reference them in your paper scriptures on the, uh, on the edges, right, with a pencil. And do that. Cross-reference the scriptures because that's how you know and understand the character of Christ best. As you cross-reference the different scriptures that are linked to each other, then you start to get a series of ideas that revolve around a truth. In, order, in other words, um, all truths will circumcise itself together into one. And it becomes part of you, part of your heart. View his death. So I'm going to open up and talk about the ones that I have here. So I will put them down so that you know them. So there's John uh, chapter 19. I'm just going to list that whole chapter. There's so many verses in there. 1 through 6, 11, 15, 21. Uh, Cross-reference that with your phone. Matthew uh, 27. Um, there's some good ones in there that we're going to look at. Those two chapters as a whole will be good to cross-reference. But you pick them. And, and cross-reference them accordingly. Um, and, of course, I love, we're going to go down to 1st Nephi, um, chapter 17. Uh, oh, let's see. 1st Nephi, chapter 17, verses, I think, 41 through 42. I believe there might be others. Let's make sure they're put together for this. Um, Elma, 33, um, 19 through 23. Okay. So the purpose of this video, I would say, is not to go through these piece by piece. At this stage, I want you to write these down, and I want you to pause this video, and I want you to go in and read these chapters and these lines and say to yourself, how does this teach me about my purpose of what Jacob is trying to say when we should view his death? This takes you to when Jesus was um, scourged, he was beaten, crown of thorns. Um, Simon was 
pressed to carry his cross. Jesus had to carry his cross. Um, and then here in these other verses, there is maybe one I want to look at, um, which this one's my favorite. So I'll expand a little bit on the Nephi ones, right? Because this delves into the Old Testament, which is a really important part about studying the scriptures and the gospel is you bring together everything. Usually if there's a singular truth, there is verses of sacred text uh, throughout the Old Testament, New Testament, within the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, uh, ancient stories everywhere, uh, alternate, uh, anything ancient. It's actually there. It's, it's quite there and, and, and good. So, but to me, viewing his death, a very important element that I will touch on, um, let's look at 1 Nephi 17. Um, you know, Nephi's teaching here, and he's talking about how the children of Israel, when they were in the wilderness, it says here that it's going to talk about the story when, when um, Moses lifted the brazen serpent. And so it says that the Lord sent fiery flying serpents among them. Now this is understanding because God is frustrated with his people, right? They're not quite doing what he's asking. They're not becoming. They're not going into a line. So he's going to bring them a trial, right? That kind of goes back into the anger piece. And of course, uh, it's going to go part into the suffering piece as well. And they get bit by these fly, fiery flying serpents, as it says. And um, if they don't look up, they are going to die. And so he's telling Moses to put a brazen serpent on a staff and raise it up. And if they'll just look, then they will live. And um, here, uh, Nephi points out a very important uh, element of that. Oop, I lost it. Um, let's see, I'll just go back here. Nephi points out a very simple thing. It says, And after they were bitten, he prepared a way that they might be healed. So notice what God's working and doing here. And the labor which they had to perform, so there's the works, the labor, the exercising of faith, the grace is there. What you need to do is go get the grace, right? The labor which they had to perform was to look. View. Um, and because of the simpleness of the way, or the easiness of it, there were many who perished. And they did harden their hearts from time to time, and they did revile against Moses and also against God. Um, so that's stage one for me. There's all of the whole understanding, everything that went in events, but then there's also the type and the shadow that the Lord is creating in his marvelous ways of teaching through um, putting together uh, the children of Israel and the brazen serpent. Because really all that it takes is to look. And we'll talk more about that in a second. But of course, in Elma, there's another reference to that same story again. So um, pushing ahead, getting closer to Jesus Christ's um, time, um, of course, you've got the same issue happening. So here it says, um, Moses was a type. So it's a type in the shadow, right? And it says, a few understood the meaning of these things because of the hardness of their hearts. But there were many who were so hardened that they would not look, and therefore they perished. And now the reason they would not look is because they did not believe that it would heal them. Oh, my brethren... If you could be healed by merely casting your eyes that you might be healed, would you not behold quickly? Or would you rather harden your hearts of unbelief and be slothful that you would not cast your eyes about that you might perish? Um, so there's this principle of looking to God. Look to God and live. Or there's another wonderful scripture and text that the Lord says, um, If thine eye be single... To the glory of God, thy whole body shall be filled with light. Um, so really, that's a daily focus. When your mind and heart, the Lord says, pray always. What does it mean to pray always? Well, there's formal prayers, there's written prayers and everything else, but there's also just going about day to day in life with your heart and mind tuned and thinking about God, um, praying to him and talking to him at any time um, in healthy ways, right? Um and it works. You just stay focused into him. Make him your, your view 
And in so doing, that focus, you'll find healing. Um, I can testify of times when I was sick and healed, when I was misguided, uh, when I needed strength and direction, ideas, thoughts came, um, people came, helped. There's all of these types of things that can happen as you exercise faith. Because the principle is, if you will exercise your faith, or view him to his death and look to him, um, that you're going to have a trial of faith. God's going to lay out something, and, and then he's going to ask you to hang in there, to endure during that trial. Because the promise is, in the scripture it says, you receive no witness until after the trial of faith. Um, I like to reword that and say, look, it is promised after the trial of faith, you will receive a witness. That is wonderful. In fact, our prophet, President Nelson, just said um, yesterday, as he sent a new video for us, he said, I, the Lord, am bound when you do what I say. And he just left it at that, right? And I testify that's true. I know that it is. So expand what it means to view his death for you in your life, what it means to hang on. There are times when you are desperate and you want to break and fall apart and this doesn't make sense, it's not working, I want to give up. That's the trial of faith. That's the part that you hang on to. Maybe you're doing it wrong. Maybe your orientation to Christ is not healthy. Maybe it's off a little bit. If so, ask him about it. Talk to someone. Talk to someone that you trust and see what you're thinking and feeling. Um, seek wise men that would know to help you kind of realign what that means. Um, so, so important. But there's something important about the easiness of the way. The last piece I would say for view is death would be, it says the, you know, the scriptures always talk about stiff necks and hard hearts. If you try to hold your head so that you can't turn it, that's a, that's a force being acted upon you. Do you think God is going to grab your head and fo force it at him so you can view him? Or is he going to be persuading and gentle and say, hey, I stand at the door and knock. And you're going to just, and you know it's right there, but your, head, your neck is stiff. You refuse to look. Because there's emotions at play. There's experiences. There's harms. I know in times, as through life as we develop, sometimes if we believe in God and have passions and love and things like that that are going, bad things happen. We tend to get upset with God. Um, that might not cause us to turn our head. Um, I don't have all the answers. I just know, I do know, by sacred experience and by 40 years on this planet and the last 20 of my life doing my best to live it, this is true. And when you do that, he comes. You receive witnesses, you grow in truth, and it's a marvelous thing. And why not view his death? His death was what makes our life possible and our eternal life possible. So... Keep that going. Ponder on that forever, day after day. But those are the scriptures for that one. Um, I love it. So, talk to me. In the comments, quotes, talk to each other. What else do you have for you as death? Are there other scriptures that you can share with the group? Let's grow and learn this together. Just remember to cross-reference and to let it sit. Let those things come in your mind. Because ultimately, that's what that means. That's feasting on the word of Christ, right? Viewing as death. Now, second one. Uh, we're going to be suffer his cross. Let me, let me get some space here. I'm not, I'm not sure if we need it. You is death. So now we'll say suffer his cross. I cannot overemphasize enough suffering. In the last couple years of my life, I've, I've uh, another great... Um, individual, I won't give names because that will be weird, but talked about how life is suffering. And I thought a lot about that. I thought about all the times that I suffered in my life. Well, what does it mean? And why is that so? Why is life suffering? Is that a truth? The Buddhists say it was. Um, and we know that because of the fall, um, men are all fallen, right? And we also know that through Christ, all men are lifted up again. Um, so, and as in Adam, all die. So in Christ shall all be made alive. So at some point, we're going to exit out of this fallen nature of this, of this world into a better existence. The thing that we need to understand is that can happen now. Um, you get glimpses and you can live in a way that your existence is beyond what our current life of suffering is. And that's called being alive in Christ. Uh, having his image on your countenance and glowing and like, you know, let your light so shine, right? 
Uh, that's ultimately what he says. But to do that, you've got to walk that path with him. You know, in our sacred text, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ, we have a very important line of scripture that's not in our scripture, but it's been quoted many times, and it's that of Eve saying, it is better for us to pass through sorrow. We might learn good from evil. We have a lot of other scriptures that will teach us that. Um, we have to know the bitter, otherwise we could never prize the sweet. And, uh, and so that's kind of where this life draws us in. And I think that if you start listening to all the gurus that talk about happiness and seeking happiness or following your passions, I mean, that's all great and good. But if you can understand that at its core, at the base of life, that life is suffering, and you know that that's the default, and that that's okay, like, did you know that? You're miserable, terrible things have happened to you, uh, life is kicking your butt, guess what? That's normal, it's normal for all of us. Some are luckier, some have it worse, some have it better. But if you can just start your baseline mentality of who you are and what you believe and how you get along in this world with the idea that suffering is normal, it's what we're all called on to do, then everything else brings better, it, it makes life better. So what are the scriptures that go with that? Now, it's the same ones that we've listed before. So rewind, go back to those. They're all there. When I talk about cross-referencing these scriptures, I've cross-referenced them, all of them, to this whole verse 8 altogether. Um, but let me look at another marvelous one uh, that I really like for suffering. Um, Or, nope, I did not have that. Never mind. Uh, okay, sorry. That just goes back to the other previous scriptures. I should have left them there. So if I was redoing this video, I would cut that and start this over with those other ones. I'm sorry. Um, so go back to John 19, um, Matthew 27. So John 19, Matthew 27, um, and note... Uh, we're all called upon to bear our cross, right? Um, gosh, there's another great story. I didn't think about this. Maybe someone can tie it into the comments for me. I should have thought of this earlier. Um, would have been great to bring in. Uh, there was a group of, of well, what were they? The Mulekites, I think, or anti -Nephites. Now I don't even remember well enough, but they were enslaved. These are some people in the Book of Mormon. Burdens are being placed upon their back, and it's painful. They're they are enslaved, and the burdens that they are called to bear are really hard, and they're really suffering. But these were people that had heretofore kept the commandments, and, um, and it says that they kept praying and getting more and more humble and softening their hearts. And as they bore their suffering with dignity and goodness, it says that the voice of the Lord came unto them and said, I'll make your burdens light. And I love that, right? We talk about that, those verses a lot, how the Lord makes your burdens light he doesn't take them away he just makes them light so you can't feel them and then you begin to submit to your suffering with cheeriness with joy um, and that's ultimately a way of life that I think is marvelous I you meet so many people that you're that sometimes you're just like how on earth can you be so happy your life is so hard they've mastered this they've been swallowed up in the joy of Christ they've they their their burdens they're not taken away, but they can bear them with ease because they're born again. They've been baptized of fire. They're living in it. They've received his image in their countenance. Uh, let's go do likewise. So what else can we mean by suffering his cross? But know this. Suffering is the baseline. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. The world wants to tell you, be whatever it is that you are, which uh, find who you are. Okay, that's true, but first you're a child of Christ, and life is not finding your passion and then living happily. It's just, it works for a lot. I mean, yes, that's true, but that's not the main point to accept. First, accept this. I, I think if you can do that and, and know what that brings, I think it can bring a lot of relief, especially if you're struggling mentally or, or emotionally, uh, in, in knowing that it's okay. And we're with you. We're all in this together, right? Bear one another's burdens. You suffer his cross just like we take each other. So I hope we do that. Um, so again, comment, give me more, whatever you think might work. And then the last piece, since this has been pretty long, I think we're just going to stay on Jacob 1.8.
Um, I had some great stuff to do on Jacob chapter two, but uh, I won't do it. We're out. We're we've already used up so much time. So bear the shame of the world. Um. So Latter Day Saints, or, or members of the Church of Jesus Christ, the Latter Day Saints, we we have a really great vision of the Tree of Life that uh, um, that's in our in our sacred text. And there's the rod that extends, and we hold to the Tree of Life, and we focus on it. And it's supposed to be a, a symbolism of living our life properly, keeping our viewing again, viewing Christ again, viewing His death, because that's where the tree is. It's where he is, so you're still viewing him again, keeping your focus, and you're going to him. And what happens here, let's look at some verses in 1 Nephi chapter 17. So let me write them up, I'm sorry. So these are the verses you're going to link for this section, and that's 1 Nephi 17. Um, oh, no, ah, rats, sorry. I am off. Hold on while I re... Oh, I fixed that. Okay, go to my verses that I've linked. And it is first... Sorry, first Nephi 8 that we know well. Um, verses 24 through 28. So we've been studying these chapters... Or these verses already. and uh, But this is a great one to link for this part. Bearing the shame of the world. So we know we need to keep our focus on him. We know and understand that suffering is going to happen. And we know and understand that if we live the, law, the life of Christ the way that we need to, you're going to have some level of shame. I hope it doesn't come from ourselves, but it may. But mostly, uh, I think if you really are doing the right thing, even if it's not believing in Jesus Christ, I, I think a lot of people... When they seek their highest good and they believe in basically live and do a Christ-like life, but they don't insert the Christ picture in it, they experience the same thing, right? You start to rise up and just start to do good, people are going to want to bring you down, right? If you're the nail that sticks down, there's someone that wants to hammer you down. You don't, you don't get to stick out, right? That's part of that. But as we look at 1 Nephi chapter 8, there's an interesting piece um, about these, this group of people and that is, they actually made it all the way to the end. They tasted of the fruit of the tree of life. So um, they're getting that reward. They're feeling the joy of the gospel. They're lighting up. They're becoming. Um, it's all there. And something very strange happens. Now, in this story, of course, we have the great and spacious building that's in opposition to the tree of life. And the great and spacious building is very nice. It has no foundation. It appears to be floating in the air. Um, that's an important element of it. But it's a fine workmanship. People are beautifully dressed. There's great socializing happening on it. It's the best the world has to offer. Um, let's read what happens as these people partake of the fruit, and then they look and see uh, what's going on with people up in the tree of uh, up in the uh, great and spacious building. It came to pass that I beheld others pressing forward, and they came forth and caught hold of the end of the rod. And they did press forward in the midst of darkness, clinging to the rod, until they came forth to partake of the fruit of the tree. So they made it all the way through. After they had partaken of the fruit of the tree, they did cast their eyes about as if they were ashamed. And I also cast my eyes about and beheld on the other side of the river of water a great and spacious building. And it stood, as it were, in the air, high above the earth. And it was filled with people both old and young, male and female, and their manner of dress was exceedingly fine, and they were the attitude of mocking, pointing their fingers towards those who had come to partake of the fruit. And after they had tasted of the fruit, they were ashamed because of those that were scoffing at them, and they fell away into forbidden paths and were lost. This is very important. The closer you draw to Christ, in my opinion, the more and more opposition you're going to have from people. Um, please live a life of dignity, of good example, of sound mind. Jacob's later going to say, if your minds are firm, if you're, if you're really strengthening your heart and mind the way you should and keeping it focused, then um, you can be like the group of people that did not turn and look and heed and see because... People are going to take a shot at you for believing in Jesus Christ and for wanting to live your life. They're going to take a shot at you for believing in the Book of Mormon. Uh, 
to being foolish and stupid enough to believe that there's something else besides the Bible that also testifies of Christ. Like the main mission of the Book of Mormon is to testify that the Bible's true. That's what it does. And, um, but people are going to mock you for that. They're going to call you a fool, right? Because all of our study and knowledge is going, and in a lot of circles, there seems to be some building up evidence that says, oh, all of this is made up and silly, or if you believe in God, you're a fool, right? Well, there's another scripture that says, fools mock, but they shall mourn. Um, so be strong. Bear the shame of what it means to believe. Um, and comment. What is it else does it mean to you to bear the shame of the world? I love how Jacob is taking all of the things that he's been taught from his father, Lehi, and his brother, Nephi, and seeing of those vision, and he sees in vision of Christ. It later says that Jacob said he saw him, that Christ came to him. I think that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And so this verse, I could just sit and talk about it and read it over and over again. It's just been absolute joy for me this week. I know I needed to read chapters 1 through 4, which I did a couple times through, but I just couldn't leave this verse alone. I loved it so much, and I adore it. Um, and it's such a great example of ways in which you can draw closer to Christ, but also link throughout the other scriptures, because primarily that's my goal. When I look to my, my brothers and sisters in life, I hope that they taste of the joy that comes from, from making a hobby out of studying the gospel, from finding these scriptures and linking them together. Again, in healthy ways, right? Some look at me and be like, Ryan, you're a little bit crazy. That might be so. I don't know. But when you do this and you bring these truths together and you start to understand, you change inside. And, um, and I love that. So that concludes my speech on <laughs> Jacob chapter 8. Uh, maybe later on tonight if there's time. I'm going to go take my kids sledding now. But if there's time, I'll delve into chapter 2 that talks about uh, polygamy and all of those things. Uh, maybe a little bit of chapter 4 as well. Um, and we'll see. Uh, in as much as we have home church now, since we can't go to our buildings, um, I've set up something here that I like. And if you like it and I, we get some good responses, I'll, I'd love to keep it up. But if you find it fruitful, because ultimately I just want to help others uh, know and feel what I know and feel and love uh, if it brings something good to their life. So Jesus Christ lives. I know it. He died and he rose again, flesh and blood. And he is our savior. I know that. And I leave that with you in Jesus' name. Amen.